Welcome to Teen Tales. My name is Nikki Madigan. I'm the curator at the museum. And the theme this year is Canada's 150th. So we're presenting stories about permanent history in the context of Canadian history over the last 150 years. And just a note that we film these presentations for the community record. Um, next week, just a heads up, Johnny Jones is going to take us on a walk through Little Lot Territory. On August 15th, Eric Anderson from Squamish will be presenting uh, Pemberton in the World News. He's looking at the history of Pemberton through the world newspapers. And the last presentation on August 22nd, Brenda McLeod will take us through the history of flood control in Pemberton, starting with the uh, PFRA project in the 40s, late 40s. We want to thank our local presenters and volunteer bakers for their support for the program. And we want to thank you for joining us today. It was pretty smoky, we weren't sure who would come out. Also want to introduce you to our program of promotions coordinator, Nathaniel Dolan Miller, who is also our chief researcher for today's presentation. And Nathaniel is producing all the Tea and Tail videos this year. We put them up on our website. He's been doing some great work for the museum. And he's currently studying history at UVic, and we're lucky to have him for the summer. Uh, today we're talking about the 1858 gold rush event in this region. It had a big, big impact here, and it was also the impetus behind the formation of the province of BC. And we'll be exploring other events in the world and in Canada that happened in 1858, along with the gold rush. So thanks for joining us today. So we'll start with some world events. So in 1858, Charles Darwin publishes his paper on the natural selection titled On the Tendency of Species to Form Varieties and on the Perpetuation of Varieties and Species by Natural Means of Selection in the Linnean Society Journal. The British Empire takes over India from the British East India Company in aftermath of the Sepoy Rebellion of 1857. And down south, Senate candidates Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas debate slavery seven times during the campaigning of Illinois Senate seat. And even though he lost the seat, he won the popular vote and earned media attention, making him the prime Republican candidate for the presidential elections. The southern states were infuriated by Lincoln's position and arguments in the debates. Other world events, Theodore Roosevelt was born. <laughs> I didn't believe it, I had to check this myself. Uh, fingerprints were first used for identification. The birth of the murder mystery. Pencils with erasers on the end were invented. <laughs> and the Fenian Brotherhood was founded in New York by John Old Mahoney. Now the Fenian raids were a milestone to Canada's 150th, so I just have a little note for you here. Uh, the Brotherhood was made up of Irish immigrants to America, the goal of Brotherhood was to support Irish independence. Basically, after the American Civil War, many radical Irish veterans joined the Brotherhood and plotted to invade Canada to hold Canada ransom uh, so that they could get Ireland back. From 1866 to 1871, the Fenians launched a series of small armed incursions in Canada each of which was put down by government forces at the cost of dozens killed and wounded on both sides. Eventually, um, this group uh, morphed into the IRA. British North America. So this is just a little story about British North America from 1840 to 1860, just what was happening. So it was made up of a bunch of scattered colonies. You have Canada, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, Vancouver Island, and British Columbia. They were all geographically, politically, and economically separate from each other, although they were all tied in with Britain. Before 1867, Britain's colonies were reflect collectively referred to as British North America. In the East, Newfoundland sat in isolation. It still kind of does. <laughs> and the separate colonies of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island had little to do with one another. In the center was the large, bickering United Province of Canada, composed of the French Catholic-dominated Lower Canada and the English Protestant Upper Canada, 
officially called Canada East and Canada West, although it was named Lower Canada and Upper Canada. People in Lower Canada didn't like to be called. They were on the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> In 1841, the formerly separate colonies of Lower and Upper Canada have been forced into an unhappy political marriage. And although Lower Canada had a much larger population, the two provinces were given the same number of elected representatives, and French Canadians resented this inequality. By 1850, immigration had changed the balance, giving Upper Canada the larger population. The Hudson's Bay Company still loosely held much of the Northwestern Territory of the continent. The prairies were a vast area already coveted by the U.S. and sparsely inhabited by First Nations, Métis, and fur traders. British Columbia was cut off by the Rocky Mountains, and it was in the throes of the gold rush, which was bringing Americans up by the thousands. The territory had become a British colony in 1858. In 1841, Upper and Lower Canada were joined to form the United Province of Canada. The colonies each had a separate government with locally elected representatives, although all were still subject to the overriding political authority of Britain. <coughs> By the 1860s, though, <coughs> Britain was growing tired of maintaining its colonies, and the costs, especially of defending British North America, were burdens that a growing number of British politicians could do without. In 1862, one member of Parliament expressed the views held by others in London. He says, I want the Canadians clearly to understand that England would not be sorry to see them depart from her tomorrow. <laughs> British North America was also facing pressure from another side. To the south, the outbreak of the American Civil War posed a threat to the safety of the colonies. And some colonial politicians felt the only way to avoid being absorbed by the U.S. was to unite. Other things that were going on in Canada in 1858 is that the dollar became the official currency of the province, and the penny, the nickel, and the dime came out when they were first minted. Canadian Club Whiskey was founded. Mm -hmm. um, the Bank of Canada was founded and is now known as CIBC. And the Canadian colonial government started to impose revenue tariffs on U.S. manufactured goods to pay for railroad debt, debts. So that was the Canadian effort. Also, in 1858, the Toronto Islands were formed after a storm cut off the Toronto Peninsula. And it was cut off then permanently from the mainland. <coughs> the wedding march became popular after Princess Vicky had it played at her wedding. The transatlantic telegraph line was laid between Ireland and Newfoundland, and the first direct connection between Canada and Europe. It failed after 28 days, though, due to an insulation problem. <clears throat> Imprisonment for debt was abolished. It was one of the major reforms in Canadian politics. Fossils were first discovered in the Kootenai by Sir, jo Sir John W. Dawson and Thomas Chesner Weston. MacDonald and Cartier proposed confederation, and it's rejected by the colonial office due to lack of support in the colonies. So though Britain wanted this to happen, the colonies of Canada did not. Double shuffle. So on New Year's Eve, John A. MacDonald convinced Queen Victoria to declare Ottawa the permanent capital of Canada. Before this, the capital rotated every year between Montreal, Quebec, Kingston, and Toronto. MacDonald wanted Ottawa because it was on the border between Canada East and West and equal distance to Kingston and Montreal, <clears throat> and you had access to the sea through the Rideau Canal. But this choice was extremely controversial, as Ottawa was a small, very rough logging town. Imagine if Squamish in the 70s was declared the capital of Canada. At that time, in 1858, John A. MacDonald was Premier of Canada and led the Liberal Conservative Party with his friend and ally, George F.J. Cartier. In opposition was the Clear Grit Party, led by George Brown. On July 28, 1858, George Brown proposed a bill to ask the Queen to reverse her decision on Ottawa as the capital. And some Conservative Party members crossed the aisle, and the bill easily passed. The MacDonald and Cartier government was forced to resign. The Governor General, Baronet William Head, 
made George Brown the new premier, and Brown chose his new cabinet. But at the time, they stated that all new ministers had to resign from Parliament to be re-elected in the writings. With Brown and his ministers resigning from Parliament, this gave the Conservatives a majority, and they gave a vote of no confidence. The Governor General refused to call a new election, and instead made John A. Premier again. John A. knew that Brown could do what he did to him and call a vote of no confidence while the Conservatives were facing elections. But McDonald had a trick up his sleeve. There was a law that stated if a minister was moved to a new ministry, he could not have to face an election if they resigned from a ministry and took a new one in the same month. This law was to allow a sitting premier to shuffle their cabinets, but it did not state that an incoming premier could not use it. So on August 6, John A. appointed his ministers to different ministries as they had before, and then on August 7, shuffled them back to their previous ministries and made Cartier the premier. This trick avoided the election and kept the Conservatives in power. This move, known as the double shuffle, is infamous as the most underhanded and clever political move in Canadian history. <coughs> now, this part of the story uh, directly relates to BC. So, in 1846, the Oregon Treaty was signed. And it set the U.S. and British North American border at the 49th parallel, with the exception of Vancouver Island, which was retained in its entirety by the British. Vancouver Island, with all coastal islands, was constituted as the colony of Vancouver Island in 1849. And the U.S. portion of the region was organized as Oregon Territory in 1848, with Washington Territory being formed in 1853. The British portion remained unorganized until 1858, when the colony of BC was declared as a result of gold rush. So the mainland of BC was truly a wild land uh, when this gold rush started. It wasn't owned by anybody, and uh, it was a free for all. So, in 1846, the Hudson's Bay Company lost a really important trading route, which was the Columbia River. So, because the 49th parallel had just been established. So, the Hudson's Bay men needed a different way to get to the coast. So, they sent A.C. Anderson out. And he started his journey in Lillooet, and he traveled on foot and canoe through Seton, Anderson, Lillooet, and Harrison Lakes. His report when passing along Seton and Anderson Lakes was not positive, though. He says, in short, there does not exist the slightest probability of a horse road in this direction, suitable for our purposes. Rocks rise a 1,000 to 1,500 feet in height on both sides and preclude all possibility of any progress by land, save perhaps by scaling the craig sides at some rare points. He also remarked that the background scenery is the most rugged and dreary looking track I've ever met with, nor had I any previous conception that so mountainous a region could exist so near the banks of a large stream like that freezer. Those of you from Darcy, can you believe the horrible things Anderson said? <laughs> this is one of the earliest maps of this region. It's uh, created by J.J. Lacan and it was from A.C. Anderson's notes of his trip through here. So it, it is not the best reproduction of a map here, but this was uh, what turned into the Gold Rush Route. This is the Fraser River here, going to the ocean. There's Harrison Lake, Lillooet Lake, and Anderson, and Seton, and Lillooet is up here. So it was a low land, Lakes wrote that Anderson discovered. <clears throat> Some other news in BC. <clears throat> the American owned Victoria Gazette is the first paper on the West Coast. The uh, Times Colonist paper is founded by Amor de Cosmos, Cosmos. And then we have the Fraser Canyon War. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So uh, the Fraser Canyon War happened up in the Lytton area, First Nations uh, area. This is the Thompson River Salish. Miners raped a woman, and some warriors tracked down and killed the miners. 
They sent headless bodies down the Fraser River to Yale as a warning. Miners in Yale panicked and they formed militias led by former mercenaries Captain Grant, who then marched on the uh, capital Kumshi. On the way there, two of the militias actually wiped each other out in friendly fire in the dark, and only two men survived. <laughs> now, the uh, Lytton warriors and their allies gathered in a war council that was led by Chief Spedlum. And Spedlum knew that his warriors could easily wipe out the militias, but that was going to cause a war with all the white men, and he was concerned about their ability to win that war. He had personal dealings with Governor Douglas, and he trusted him to keep the peace between the white men and the First Nations. At the same time, the leader of one of the miners' militias, Captain Snyder, convinced the miners not to engage in extermination as proposed by Captain Grant. Grant's militia did engage in raiding and sacking of native villages and food caches, though. When the militias arrived at Kumshi, Snyder wrongly assumed that the First Nations had been intimidated by the miners' more modern guns, so this is why they didn't attack. However, the warriors and their allies were actually also ready for peace. So it was Snyder with the militias and Spitlam with the Lytton Band that negotiated this treaty, this peace treaty. And then Douglas arrived with the Royal Engineers and he was infuriated by Americans negotiating a treaty which could only be done by him. So he disbanded the militias and made them swear an oath to follow the Queen's law from this time forward. So this was kind of the first moment Governor Douglas uh, took control during the gold rush. And then we have McGowan's War. Um, American miners from Hills Bar assaulted black barber Isaac Dixon for attending a Christmas party in Yale. Dixon complained to the Yale magistrate, this guy's name is Wong, who put him under protective custody. The Hills Bar Magistrate Carrier, who had been feuding with the Yale Magistrate, sent a deputy to bring Dixon to Hills Bar for testimony. The deputy refused to recognize the authority of the Yale Magistrate, who then threw him in jail for contempt of court. The angry Hills Bar miners, headed by Ned McGowan, set out with a warrant issued by the Hills Bar Magistrate Carrier to arrest the Yale Magistrate Juanel for contempt of court for imprisoning this constable Hickson. The American flag flew on the flotilla sent up from Hills Bar, causing Wanell to remark that it seemed as if McGowan was going to make a national affair of the matter. <coughs> McGowan, given the status of special constable by Perrier, threw open the jail and set all the prisoners free and brought Magistrate Wanell back to Hills Bar by boat. Wanell hastily penned a note to Governor James Douglas, playing on his fears and intentions of the American. And he says, the town and district are in a state bordering on anarchy. <coughs> My own and the lives of the citizens are in imminent peril. And an effective blow must at once be struck on the operations of these outlaws, else I tremble for the welfare of the colony. The stories relate to Victoria by the messengers was that Ned McGowan had launched an attempt to overthrow the British authority in the new colony and declare the gold fields to be part of the U.S. Given McGowan's unsavory reputation and the compatible nature of the incident, which had the two communities up in arms, caused significant alarm in Victoria. So Moody and the Royal Engineers, the Columbia Detachment, accompanied by Justice Matthew Bailey Becky, made the arduous trip to the Yale, where Moody and the engineers prevented violence and begged the convened court. Another group of Marines remained stationed at Fort Langley to resist any action by the nearby troops of the U.S. Border Commission <coughs> that were stated, <coughs> stationed in nearby Whatcom County. On hearing the tangled web of cases and charges resulting from the misconduct of both Justices Carrier and Monell, McGowan was fined for assault, and both magistrates were dismissed from their posts, thus ending the bloodless war, which afterward became known as Ned McGowan's War. So another uh, piece of drama at the start of the province's history. <coughs> oh, 
some other news is that we had 30,000 Chinese nationals make up the first major Chinese settlement in Canada. Now, they mostly came up from San Francisco and they worked in the gold rush. The vast majority were young, single men, so not too many women. Also, about 600 African Americans from California moved to Victoria by invitation from Governor Douglas, who was a mulatto himself. But the invitation was later revoked after there was anger from white Americans. And the British Columbia Provincial Police were established. Some other news in BC, the Royal Engineer Corps were called to BC to help with development and security of the colony. Colonel Richard Moody of the Royal Engineers Corps becomes Chief Commissioner of Land Works. Moody often feuded with Governor Douglas over the development of the colony and the role of the Royal Engineers. Matthew Begbie, the hanging judge sent from England to be Chief Justice for Vancouver Island in British Columbia. So he came all the way from England. Governor Douglas basically had these incidents with the Gallons War and the Fraser Canyon War and called in all these big guns from England to help him out get control of this wild man territory. And then James Douglas becomes the governor of BC and Vancouver Island colonies. The big event, and I know that's why you're all here, but we're not handing gold out during the presentation. <laughs> Uh, the gold rush. So the Hudson's Bay Company ships 22 kilograms of gold on the Beaver to San Francisco. That's worth 1.1 million dollars today. The influx of Americans into British Columbia forced the Colonial Office to focus on colonization uh, of overcommerce in BC, so that the region could not be claimed by the USA. HBC Charter on New Caledonia is not renewed, and it becomes the colony of British Columbia. It was personally named by Queen Victoria, and New Westminster was built to be the capital. And then we have a little video. British Columbia was very different 150 years ago. For many centuries, it was solely the domain of the First Nations. In the late 1700s, European fur traders began to arrive. Then one day in 1856, a native man was taking a drink from the Thompson River when he noticed a glittering pebble. And with that, the history of British Columbia was changed forever. The pebble, of course, was gold. The First Nations people quickly learned how the Europeans treasured this shiny metal. Soon, the entire band was collecting bits of it to trade at Fort Kamloops. James Douglas, head of the Hudson's Bay Company in the district and also governor of Vancouver Island, at first provided them with spoons to help pry the gold out of the rocky crevices. Later, the company supplied picks, shovels, and gold pans. The First Nations were angry when American miners appeared on the scene and tried to push them aside. By 1857, Douglas feared there would be war between the Americans and the First Nations along the Fraser and Thompson Rivers. In the spring of 1858, a thousand ounces of gold was sent to be processed at the San Francisco Mint. Soon, word leaked out where it had come from, and the rush to the Fraser River was on. About 20,000 miners headed north that year. Fearful that Americans would start taking over the territory, Douglas extended his authority to the mainland, which was not yet a colony. Soon, however, the British government established the mainland colony of British Columbia and named James Douglas its governor as well. The Fraser River Gold Rush was only the first of several gold rushes into nearby regions, but it was the catalyst in 1858 in creating what we now call British Columbia. It's a copy from the BC archives, but this is a map of this region that was done by the Royal Engineers in 1860. The, uh, the map is showing the mountainous 
uh, areas as well as the lakes. So this is Harrison Lake, Little Wet Lake, Anderson, and Sea Peak. And we have this uh, posted next door in the transportation exhibit. So the gold rushers were charged a tax of $25 and they could pay in gold or in labor uh, to build the Douglas Trail. A crew of 500 men was assembled to work on the trail and were under the commissioner, A.C. Anderson. Didn't he get an awesome job <laughs> after finding the lakes road? They established Port Douglas at the head of Harrison Lake and they constructed a trail called the Douglas Portage to the south end of Lillooet Lake, where another building was raised. Then in early September, Port Pemberton was established at the head of Lillooet Lake, and the name honored Joseph Despart Pemberton, who was the Surveyor General of Vancouver Island. He was the boss of the Royal Engineers. And by mid-October, the rough trail was passable. In 1859, Lieutenant H. Spencer Palmer of the Royal Engineers began surveying the wagon roads that would replace the trails between the lakes. And this map is from those first surveys. <coughs> now, Douglas made a proclamation. He made quite a few his first year as governor, but one of them was uh, the Road Tolls Act. And this is what empowered agents of the government to collect the tax from the miners passing through. And basically, it said that Britain was taking control of these wild lands that Britain wanted in England. So because he, D Governor Douglas wanted to keep law and order at all costs after the murders of the strike of the California <coughs> Oil Rush, so he asked for England's help. Matthew Bigby soon arrived on scene. And he and his traveling companion, Arthur Bushby, traveled the new route in 1859 to report to Douglas. At Fort Langley, actually, in 1858, Douglas and Begby swore each other into their respective offices since they were the highest officials on the mainland. Uh, Begby was known as the hanging judge, though I understand he only hung one man. He did put the fear of death into all wrongdoers. Here's an excerpt from Bushby's journal of their travels through the Pemberton area. So Bushby says, started early after a good breakfast of beans and coffee, met a lot of Chinamen, and the old white horse gave out today. We had an excellent meal at Mr. O'Brien's store. How did we just peg into it after living for a month on bacon and flour? Pemberton is at the foot of Lillooet Lake and will be a rising place. I have just been to the lake and had a good wash. My boots have, been give, have given way, and my flannel shirt, which I've had in constant wear since March 8th, is getting rather dirty. Beard is getting long and shaggy. Hands and face well browned and scratched. Hands and feet ditto. In capital condition. I am now scribbling on a pile of blankets in a tent in the very lap of luxury, and am now off to try and get a shot at some ducks. The journals of Begbie as they make their way through the region of our lyrics. These are some of the earliest images we have of uh, this period in the region. So the first image you see there that's a hand-drawn image is um, Port Douglas. And then we have Port Pemberton is the earliest known photograph of Port Pemberton, uh, about 1860. And the hand drawing is uh, 29 mile. And then just for fun, we had to throw a camel in. This is uh, from Little Wet's history, but the camels came through this region too. So, Port Pemberton and 29 Mile um, were near each other. Mule trains and flat bottom boats were used along the trail in the first year. In the early years, camels were also used as pack animals. However, they frightened up all the mules on the trail and they were soon abandoned and left, left to wander around Little Wet. A quote is, at the first whip of a camel, mules and oxen did everything but climb trees. <laughs> Prior to the large stern wheelers plying the waters of the lake, the first year of the gold rush saw many First Nation packers, canoers, and entrepreneurs with flat bottom longboats who made their living moving the hordes of gold rushers through the area. From Mount Curry, Felix Leo, 
Paul Dick's father and Charlie Mack's father who were involved as packers in those early years. Chief Francis Wallace remembered traveling the route as a child with his father who was also a packer. In October of 1858, the road building party tried to stop a Chinese company who were ferrying provisions across Little Wet Lake. I imagine there were also lots of mini disputes back then over who was ferrying who and uh, who could get to the gold fields the fastest. Uh, these are again hand drawn images that appeared in the Illustrated London News in Europe. And uh, the first image is of Port Anderson, and the second image is of Cage Flats, which today we know as Lilwet. So other settlements of note were Port Anderson, Seton, or at that time it was called Short Portage, and Lilwet. These drawings um, carried the news of the gold rush in British Columbia to Europe. The early BC gold rush was mainly documented by drawings and paintings as easy portable camera technology didn't exist until 1888. The 1890 Klondike gold rush is really well documented uh, by photos. The BC gold rush, not so much. This is a drawing of the Prince of Wales. It was one of these steamships that worked on the lakes and it um, was on Lillooet Lake. A bit of history about the steamships. In June 1860, the 65-foot Marzell began carrying sorted cargo for mines and mining. And by this time, Port Douglas merchants had imported a number of wagons. So the Marzell was on the lake before the Prince of Wales. Uh, the Prince of Wales replaced the Marzell in 1863, and it was 115 feet long. The Marzell was only 65 feet long. Now, the Prince of Wales was only possible because the Royal Engineers built a dam to raise the level of Little Lillooet Lake, which today on the maps we know as Tenas Lake, because it had to be brought to the same level as Lillooet Lake. The stern wheelers would be winched between the dangerous passage between the two lakes, and Joe Peters of Mount Perry spoke of community stories of Little Wap men that helped with the winching operation. In 1860, two other new steamers were built for the chain of lakes between Port Douglas and Lillooet, the Lady of the Lake on Anderson Lake, and the Champion on Sea. <laughs> this is a, a little cool fact. you got to wonder how they brought this equipment in. Governor Douglas reported that the boilers were so large for the steamers, they were too heavy to carry on mules, so they were cut into five sections and rolled over the trail. The Lady of the Lake was built for Chapman and Co. It was 72 feet, and it only had 14 horsepower. It was a splendid model, they say, but the engines were too small, and they were hardly able to withstand the sudden squalls, which are a boating hazard on Anderson Lake. She finished her days on the beach at Seaton Portage and gradually washed into the lake. <laughs> this is a Royal Engineer drawing of Port Pemberton, and it was made to illustrate the proposed road extension to a new place to tie up. It shows a large building belonging to P. Smith and Company, Nelson's Barn, a Spaniard's Cabin, and Pemberton House. There was also a Little Watt village at this site. Several squats also existed, and these squatters were evicted in 1863 when the road improvement works began. This extension led from the port to an all-seasons landing with room to turn a team farther down the lakeshore. Officials at the time believed heavy traffic would continue through the area for some time. This is 1863. The sad news is shortly thereafter that this road closed. <laughs> this is that same picture now positioned over a 1970s aerial photo of the region. So you can see there's no lake there, right? It's all trees. So the head of the lake has moved significantly since 1858. So today's Port Pemberton is in the bush. 
and there are no real remains of the site. Port Pemberton Shelters and Eats. Uh, by 1859, Port Pemberton had five to six log cabins, shelters and eating places for the men who rode the boats, for the mule drivers, and for the travelers. The two restaurants served bacon, beans, bread, and butter, and tea for a dollar. By 1860, there were 14 buildings. Two early businesses that operated in Port Pemberton were Mr. Drinkhall's Pemberton House and Otis Parsons Store. Two travelers reported that in 1859 they purchased 13 pounds of bacon for $9.75, a horse for 75, and brandy for 50. Payment was usually in gold dust. Also, entrepreneurial farmers were selling potatoes for a buck each, and tomatoes and cucumbers were 75 cents each. In 1858, that was big money. Some of the first preemptions or privately owned land in the mainland were in this area, in this Port Pemberton area, and in Port Douglas, Port Anderson, and Shore <coughs> Portage. The route to the gold fields opened a route for farmers to reach the rich lands of Pemberton. And even in the first years, they were staking lands at the foot of Mount Curry. Fresh vegetables were ex extremely scarce and farmers have really never done better. So in 1859, one settler cleared upwards of 240 pounds sterling an acre growing potatoes. Today that would be about $471 an acre. Preempting land meant you, you would stake corner posts and record your uh, stake with the magistrate at Port Douglas, and then the settler had to live on the land and approve it, have it surveyed, and finally paid for it at the rate of about a dollar an acre in 1860. And then you received a crown grant. The first preemption recorded at Douglas was for P. Smith & Co. who owned a stopping place at Port Pemberton. John Shaw was the second preemption. And in 1861, David Douglas and James Scotty Halliday stayed the third preemption. By 1861, the Douglas Trail was a 12-foot wide wagon trail and was the first highway on the mainland because they charged a tax for it as well. <laughs> so by the mid-1860s, the gold rush had really run its course. Good times were over. And the number of miners was falling dramatically. They were uh, making their way north into the Klondike. The mainland colony had run up a huge debt from building roads to the gold fields. To save money, in 1866, Britain folded the Vancouver colony into its British Columbia counterpart. The long-term future of the United Colony of British Columbia became much debated. Arrivals from within British North America looked to entry in the new Canadian Confederation created in 1867 out of uh, the four British colonies of Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Others sought annexation to the U.S. In 1867, the day after Britain confirmed the Canadian Confederation, the U.S. purchased Alaska from Russia, which renewed its interest in the intervening landmass, which we know as British Columbia. The American Secretary of State was convinced that our population is destined to roll its restless waves to the icy barriers of the North. U.S. Secretary of State proposed to take British Columbia in settlement. Britain did so not out of love for its remote colony, but because the Royal Navy had just recently moved its Pacific Coast headquarters north from Chile to Victoria, and it was also near coal deposits that could service its steamships. So to give up British Columbia would inconvenience the Royal Navy. The sequence of events that began in the spring of 1858 concluded on July 1st, 1871, with British Columbia becoming a Canadian province instead of a British colony. The excitement of the gold rush, followed by the proclamation of the colony of BC, had not assured the future, but they made it possible. British Columbia in 1871 was still a very fragile place. While large in physical size, over twice Washington and Oregon combined, its settler population was in youth at one-tenth of their 110,000.
So it's really 1858 marks the beginning and end of what was a very short era, really. Uh, the gold rush was over in this region by 1864. The road uh, fell into disuse. The new Caribou, Caribou Road was begun in 1862 and was completed the following year. An exodus from Pemberton commenced. This map shows the two routes with posted travel distances. The Douglas route took 40 days and was expensive due to the transfer of freight from boat to wagon. The Yale route was far cheaper and convenient. You loaded your wagon and away you went. In 1869, the machinery was removed from the Prince of Wales to be installed in a steamer on the Upper Fraser. And then remember I said the third person that preempted was Scotty Halliday. Well, Scotty Halliday was accused of murdering Tom Poole. Today we have a place named called Poole Creek. It's named after the Poole Stopping House. So Tom Poole was murdered along with his children in 1879. And the few settlers that were still here from that old brush period, they left them. So there was nobody left by 1882. However, the fragile beginnings of BC took root, and by 1873, railway surveys were coming through the region, which spurred settlement in the area again. John Curry arrived in 1885, and the era of permanent settlement begins. He preempted District Lot 164 and 165 in 1888 with his partners Dugald MacDonald and Owen Williams, and he soon became the first postmaster of the area. The Curry lands were eventually sold and subdivided in 1910 with the coming of the railroad in 1914. The rest is history. <laughs>